All right, I'm going to walk through the tic-tac-toe project this week. Just a few uh, walkthrough topics, what we're going to go through today. I'm going to discuss these first three things uh, in detail, and I'll copy and paste them into REPL, and I'll talk about each of these. And then these three are new things that I'm going to walk through during the project. Okay, so we'll talk about these during the project just because these are a little bit more advanced and involve actually working through a bigger project in order to use them. Uh, this is a link to the TK Inter videos. There are no new videos that you need to watch this week, but I left that link there just in case you want to access some of the older videos. Um, maybe watch them as a refresher because this project will be using TK Inter. I had someone email me the other day and were asking me uh, questions, but they were acting like TK Inter was different from Python, like they were two separate things, um, like they're two different coding languages. So TK Inter is just a module that we use in Python. Okay, it's just something that we can access and use. So TK Inter is a part of Python. It's like, imagine Python um, has its own library like an actual library that you go to and pick out books from that none of you guys probably ever go to anymore. So imagine they have their very own library and you go and you see all these books of all these different things and each book can help you with Python. Well, one of the books might be labeled TK Inter. One of the books might be labeled Turtle. One of the books might be labeled Time. Right? These are just different modules that exist. And once you pick that book out, you can open it up and it will give you step-by-step -step directions on how to actually use that module. So we're using different bits from TK Inter, but we're not programming in, like TK Inter isn't different from Python. Some of you guys were saying, well, I don't like, someone said, what did they say? Um, I was wondering when we can start learning more about Python instead of TK Inter. And I was like, well, TK Inter is a part of Python. I understand maybe you want to learn more concepts about uh, in Python, but TK Inter is a module that's used and it's a part of Python and just a module that you can download. Okay, so there's some videos in there. We'll talk a little bit about algorithmic efficiency. I'll walk through that. Undecidable or unsolvable problems. I'll uh, we'll also talk about a heuristic approach to solving problems. And then here's the project down here. Okay, so that's what I got. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Let me take this away, there we go. I'm gonna go ahead and get started by copying and pasting these first three topics into REPL. So I'll open up a new REPL over here. And I'm gonna go ahead and choose Python as the language that I wanna use. And then I'll say example 2021. I'm just typing today's date. Um, and it is 1424. Okay. And go ahead and create a new REPL. I'll be working it. All right. So it might take a second to load this up. Now I'm going to paste those three topics that I want to talk about. The first one is going to be something that I like to call the take turns algorithm. I don't know like the real official name. I can't find like a real name for it. So I'm gonna call it the take turns algorithm. But we're gonna talk about how to let a user take turns. All right, and then we'll also talk about nested functions, which are just functions inside of other functions. And then last, we'll talk about, oops, last we'll talk about clicking down there. It does not like, it does not wanna click there, All right? We'll talk about the line continuation character, which really just means if you have a really long line of code, um, not in REPL, but actually like an idle and PyCharm or uh, Visual Studio Code or any other IDE that you're using, um, how to actually have that line of code not disappear and go off the screen um, when you're actually writing the code, but how to make it look a little cleaner and neater using something called a continuation character, right? Anyway, so we'll start with the very first one, the take turns algorithm, okay? Let's start off by, let's say that I want to, let's say I want to make a game, right? Just a very like short couple line program, right? I want to make a game where um, 
it's a soccer game, so I want to make a soccer game. I love soccer. Um, where the user, it's a two-player game, and the user just takes turns taking penalty kicks. In soccer, at the end of a game, um, if you're in a tournament and you want to see who moves on and the game's tied, you go to something called penalty kicks, where one player kicks the ball at the goal, and if it goes in, it's a goal. If they miss, it's a miss. But usually there's like a process where one team takes a kick and the other team takes a kick. One team takes a kick, the other team takes a kick. I'm going to make a very simple version. So I make a soccer game where um, players are rotating, taking penalty kicks. And I'll just say um, team one and team two. I'll capitalize that, all right? Team one, team two. And that's just, this is just a description of what I'm going to make here. Make a soccer game. So let's go ahead and do that. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to use a forever loop, a while true loop. So everything inside of here will just loop on forever and ever and ever until we tell it not to. All right, so let's see. Let's go ahead and say, I guess, uh, I'll call I'll create a, a variable called current team, and I'll say the very first team to kick will be called team one. All right, and while true, I'll say um, I'll say print current team is up to kick. Now it's their turn to kick. All right, after that, I'm going to ask them if they want to take the kick, All right? So I'll say kick, I'll create a variable called kick, and I'll ask the user, do you want to continue? And take the kick? Question mark. All right? And then, so you're asking the user, do you want to continue and take the kick? If kick is equal to yes, right? if it's equal to yes, then the user will will uh, print something out, right? We'll, we'll tell it what to do there. But if they don't want to kick, so if they don't want to kick, then we'll go ahead and just break them out of this loop. Okay. So what do I want to print out? If they take the kick, right, then I want to print out um, whatever team is up. So current team. Shoots and scores. Okay, and then afterwards, here's where the meat is. This is this is the take turns algorithm I'm about to do. We want to switch it so it's the other team's turn to kick. So there's a take turns algorithm that exists, and you can say if um, if current team is equal to team one, then I want to switch to, so team two is up. And the way I do that, I say current team is assigned. Now it's going to be team two. Okay. Else, if current, if team one is not up, which means team two is up, right, then the current team will be assigned to team one. Let me just walk through this for you real quick. So we want to take turns kicking. Okay, so if the user does decide that they want to take a kick and continue, the user, the team is going to shoot and score. And then it says, if current team, so the team that just took the kick, if it was team one, then we're going to switch it so team two is up. Um, if it wasn't team one, which means it must be team two, right? We're going to switch the next team up to team one. 
All right. So this is called the take turns algorithm, or at least that's what I'm going to call it. And remember, an algorithm is just a set of step-by-step -step instructions. So when I say the take turns algorithm, that just means for any program that you ever write, if you have two choices and you want to take turns between the two options, tic-tac-toe, for example, right? If you ever want to take turns between the two, you can use something called the take turns algorithm. So you will use this algorithm in your tic-tac-toe program to switch between X's and O's, whose turn it is to go up. And all you would need to do is just change the variable names and the output. So let's go ahead and run it. Okay. Team one is up to kick. Do you want to continue and take the kick? I'll well, say yes. Team one shoots and scores. Team two is up to kick. See, it worked. And if I say yes, let's see if it goes back to team one. Team two shoots and scores. Team one is up. All right. So every time I say yes, now team two is going to be up. Now team one is going to be up. And if I say, no, I don't want to kick, it breaks out of it. The main thing to get out of this little mini program here, what was it, 10 lines of code, right? The main thing is this take turns algorithm, all right? It just switches back and forth between users. And the more algorithms that you learn, um, really it's just a, a, a common uh, algorithm that you'll come across. But the more algorithms that you learn and understand, then that becomes makes programming a lot easier because you're like, oh yeah, I used that in a previous project. I can just maybe even copy and paste my code from that, or you memorize it and you already know how to do that. Right. So for now on, if you ever write a program where you're taking turns between two users, you can use this algorithm. And you might have a different way of writing it, but this, in my opinion, is the easiest way of writing a take turns algorithm. All right. So that works. I'm going to go ahead and put this inside a um, block string. And I'm going to send this down below off the screen. So I'm going to look at it. And I'll even take out this comment because we already made that game. All right, so now the next thing I want to talk about are nested functions. And they're just, we already know how to make functions. We already know how to define functions and call functions. but I want to show you guys how to put a function inside of a function. We we just actually created a nested if. See how there's an if inside of an if? That's called a nested conditional or a nested if statement. How do we create a nested function? Right? What are nested functions? So I'm going to go ahead here and define a few functions. I'm going to use different types of animals. So I'll define a function called mammals, okay? And I'm gonna print out, um, I don't know, let's think of a type of mammal, um, dogs, works. And then after dogs, let's say cats. And another type of mammal, Squirrel. I think that's how you spell squirrel. And one more type of mammal. A lion. How about that? Lion. Like lions. All right. So these are just some mammals, right? And remember, if I just like run this program right now, nothing happens because all I did was define this function. I say, hey, whenever you call mammals, this is what you do. You print dogs, cat, squirrel, lion. But I never actually called it. I just created the function. So the way I can call it, and this is a bit of a review, I can just use this and say mammals, right? And run it. And then it prints out dogs, cats, squirrel. Maybe I should say squirrels and lions to make them all plural, right? I'll run it again. Dogs, cats, squirrels, lions. All right, so I'll take out, I'll take that out and I'll say, I want to find another function here and I'll say birds. All right, so the first birds that come to mind are ravens because they just made the playoffs. Well, right, and then the other hometown team here in Baltimore where I live, Orioles are birds. Maybe we'll stick with teams here. I'll say like falcons. 
And then last one, another bird. An owl is a bird, right? That's not a team name, but I think um what's the college? Temp temple or temple of the owls? I kinda wanna know, but I think Temple's mascot of the owls. Maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, we're gonna go ahead here and find a third function. I'm gonna call this reptiles. All right. So a lot of people don't like reptiles. I, I like like there are these like they're called skinks. I thought they were geckos. I don't know the difference. Um, they were like little lizards, little black lizards that would crawl around on my porch during summertime. Right. Well, I was calling them geckos forever, and I found out they're called skinks. So, right. So we'll say skinks or reptiles. If you don't know what a skink is, look it up. Um, and then I'll say snakes. And when I went to the zoo, there was an aquarium. Went to the aquarium over the summer. There were these Komodo dragons, and they were huge. And I think I spelled it right. And then another reptile. I would say lizards, right? About iguanas. Right. So I have three different functions, and if I run it, nothing happens because I don't call it any of them. Right. So I'm going to go ahead here and create a fourth function. Check this out, and I'm going to call it animals. Right. And let's say these lists were really long and included all the possible mammals and all the birds and all the reptiles. Right. I don't want to do that because that would take a long time, and I don't even know how many different types of like, let's say, how many types of reptiles are there? Approximately 10,000. Yeah, that's a lot. Oh, I guess about 5,700 living species. That's a lot. I'm not typing all them out, so I'm going to write four. Let's say I want to create a function that prints out all different types of animals, right? And I've already classified them by mammals birds, reptiles, and all that. So if I want to print all of them out, rather than retyping all those, I could do this. I could say, um, let's say mammals, and call the mammals function, right? And then I could call the birds function, and then I could call the reptiles function. Now notice this. Notice that these functions are inside these functions are inside another function. And I'll explain how it works in a minute here. But if I go ahead and finally call, well, if I don't, if I don't call it at all, nothing happens, right? Nothing happens. So if I call the animals function, I click run. All of my animals that I have in mammals, birds, and reptiles are all printed out here. Now let me walk through and take a step back and show you what I just did. So I have this function called animals. And when animals is called, it goes up and it finds, all right, where is animals? Oh, it's right here. Okay. All right. So animals, what's inside animals? Mammals. The mammals function. What does the mammals function do? And it goes up from the top and it starts and looks and it finds, oh, there's the mammals function. And it goes inside of it and it says, what do I do? Oh, I have to print out dogs, cats, squirrels, and lions. And if you were to slow it down super, super slowly, you would see that the way it worked was it printed out these four things. And then it took a quick break and jumped back to animals where it was. And it went down to the next one. And it said, all right, where's birds? And it went and found birds. It said, all right, what's inside birds? I have to print ravens, orioles, falcons, owls. All right, I'll do that. And then it jumps back to where it was before, to birds. And it moves down to reptiles. And it prints out, finds reptiles. And it prints out everything. It does everything that's inside that function. And then finally, it's over. Right, and it would move on to the rest of the program. So that's how you would nest functions inside one another. So you would call several functions. You'll be doing this in our tic tac toe project this week. So I figured I'd show you how to do that and be explicit about that. All right. So once again, if I run it, and that makes it easier too. So let's say like I create another function animals here, and I typed out all those same things. Some of you might think, well, why can't I just copy and paste all these print statements inside animals? Well, let's say um, Orioles became extinct, 
which the baseball team has been awful. Let's just say the Oriole bird you know, in general became extinct and you want to remove it from birds, but you want to replace it with a new species of bird they found, right? Let's say it's just like, I don't know, I'll make it simple. Let's say it's just like a blue jay, right? Blue jays. You want to replace Orioles with blue jays. Rather than replacing it here and finding it there and then going and trying to find an animal and replacing it there, you only have to replace it in one location. So if I print it out, you see how Orioles was replaced with blue jays? Right, so it's a lot easier that way. And we do it to save time coding and less confusion. All right. Gives you the power to do a lot more too. So those are nested functions, and I gave you those examples. Now, there's this thing called the line continuation character. And in REPL, if you've just been using REPL this whole time, right, you might not notice this problem. But you know, if I like try to type out like a longer sentence, right, and say, Hi, my name is Mr. Danza, and this is an example of a really, really long sentence that runs off the screen and keeps going on and on and this is probably getting annoying but now i am done all right now notice this right you notice how REPL automatically moves us down to the next line for you and the next one next one that's, it doesn't actually do that. That's just like the way it looks, right? So if I were to print this out, like and to print out that, it would print out just fine. But if I'm a programmer, right, and I'm writing code in, see how this is all line 30? If I'm writing code in Idle or Visual Studio Code or PyCharm, this long line of code just kind of runs off the screen. Check this out. So if I like say Idle, right? Open up idle and I'll go ahead and create a new. I'll call this tic tac toe. Today's day is 2021 0106 and the time is 1443. Right? So if I go and I create. Oh, I guess I should have saved it. Right, save as. Let's see here. I mean, I have multiple windows open. All right, that's fine, whatever. So let's say I go ahead here and just print this. Notice how it kind of runs off the screen. Look at this. So if I wanted to go all the way to the beginning of my line of code, I have to go back pretty far, right? And it just runs off the screen. I have to like expand it. Right? Some of you guys might have experienced this during your Dragon Adventure project, um, and you guys found ways to break it up. Now, I'm not talking about printing it out in a new line. I'm just talking about organizing it from a coding perspective, right? So you guys ever sit in a chair for too long, your back starts to hurt? That's what's going on right now. So let's say I want to just make this look nicer, right? And the way I can do that is, let's say I wanted to like just hit like enter and to show up down there. Notice if I hit enter, it like doesn't recognize this code. If I like run this, check it out. It'll be like, hey, look, there's an error. Like, why is this happening? And it shows me that red space. So say this is an example of the way that I can continue that line into the next line and make it look nicer, I can use the backsla backslash. I almost said backspace, backslash, I don't know what I almost said, backsplash, I don't know what that was. But if I use that symbol and then hit enter, right, and let's say I do it again right here, right, and I can do it again right here, right, this allows me to continue my line on the next line. Okay. Now watch this, if I run it, those backslashes don't show up because that's like an escape character. Hi, my name is Mr. Danza, and this is an example of a really, really long sentence that runs off and keeps going, right? So you notice those slashes aren't there. 
So the Python, um, goodness, I can't think today. The, um, the interpreter, when the code editor reads it, it processes all the information that you send in all the code and it doesn't show the backslash, right? So those backslashes cannot be seen, right? They just tell the, the computer that, hey, look, so let's go ahead and skip over this. The same way, remember how we had our backslash N as an escape character to move to the next line? That's that. So this, um, this backslash is really just to make your code look nicer. And there are going to be some longer lines of code that we write this week. And if you're using a code editor, it might be hard to see what you wrote. Um, so this is an option to do it. So you might see me do it. And this is why I'm using it. All right. So that's that. Those are the three things I really want to talk about before starting the project. All right. So take turns algorithm, nested functions, and line continuation characters. All right, go ahead and close out of how many reptiles there are. And we'll move on to the tic-tac-toe project. So I went through these three. I'm going to talk about these three in the, the last three here during the, tic, during the tic-tac-toe project, excuse me. And um, they're a little bit more advanced, so I'll go through them. All right, so like I said, this, this link is here if you want to learn a little bit more about TK Inter. It's not new topics, but just to um, just to go back over them. It says algorithmic efficiency. We talked about algorithms. We talked about um, the take turns algorithm, but there exist problems that computers cannot solve. And even when a computer can solve a problem, it may not be able to do so in a reasonable amount of time. Um, there are like. A lot of problems that exist that might not make sense to use to actually do right you might need computers to solve problems so it says when determining the efficiency of an algorithm explain the difference between algorithms that run in reasonable time and those that do not also identify situations where a heuristic solution may be more appropriate so what is a heuristic solution so a heuristic solution or a heuristic approach is just like, imagine it's like trial and error. A lot of times I go through when I'm coding, I use a heuristic approach where I try something and if it doesn't work, I change it and I'll try something else and I'll change it. So sometimes trial and error, a heuristic approach may be more appropriate. I have a definition over here and it's really long. It says uh, an approach to problem solving or self-discovery so you're learning on your own here by mistakes that employs a practical method. Practical means actually doing it, right? It's not guaranteed to be perfect, but it's sufficient for reaching an immediate or short-term goal, right? Um, sometimes if you spend too much time planning, you might end up um, wasting time or you might not meet a deadline because you're planning too much. It's kind of just starting something and... and not winging it, but uh, attempting to do something and not having the, the most sophisticated plan. And I'll be honest, when I go through some of these videos, like I don't have the perfect plan going into it. Um, I have confidence that I know the subject matter well enough that if I do encounter a problem, that I'll be able to fix it. And you'll see in this video, I guarantee at some point when I'm programming, when I'm making this project, this tic-tac-toe project, I guarantee there's a point where I run my code and I get an error. I think about it. And it might take me a little bit longer than some of you, or some of you might um, take a little bit longer than myself when going through and solving a problem. But I go through and I try and solve that problem. And for you guys, you guys have to know that when you write a program, it never always happens the way you want it to. Right? You might be writing, you don't like to think of this program that you want to write, and then all of a sudden you write it and have perfect code, and there's no errors, and you don't have to debug anything. A lot of programming is finding errors and debugging them, right? So it's common for programmers to find errors in their code and to go back and fix them. So a heuristic approach is more of like trial and error, where you do enough planning to get started, but then go through and make changes as you go.
Okay. I don't just come in and just wing these projects. I spend some time planning, but not to the point where I have every single word I say spelled out perfectly. I'm not reading a script, right? I'm not re I'm going off of my experiences and I'm going off what I've learned, right? There are some times I might have to research and look some things up, right? If I'm working on a project outside of the scope of this class, right? But a lot of times I just jump right into it. And sometimes I'm able to solve problems in a different way than what I expected and what other people might have expected. Okay, so it says a problem is a general description. Okay, a problem is a general description of a task that can or cannot be solved algorithmic, algorithmically. So this is a definition of a problem, right? An instance of a problem also includes specific input. All you guys know what problems are. For example, sorting is a problem. Sorting the list 2317 is an instance of the problem. So if you want to sort something, even though if it, even if it's a solvable problem, it still means it's a problem. It's something that you want to do, right? It's a task that can be solved uh, or at least tried to be solved. A decision problem is a, is a specific problem with a yes or no, right? Um, a lot of questions that um, that you have, bigger, broader, general questions, can be broken down into smaller or decomposed into smaller questions that can answer yes or no. That's why computers work in zeros and ones, ones and offs, trues and false, right? So yes and no. An optimization problem is a problem with the goal of finding the best solution among many. Okay, so you want to find the shortest route or the best way of solving a problem. The, the solution is not good enough. You want to find the best solution. Sometimes you might be taking like a multiple choice question, a, a multiple choice test or quiz, maybe for another class, and it says, which is the best possible solution? And you might get the question wrong, and your answer might be correct, but not be the best possible. You're, sorry, your answer might be an actual answer to the problem, but might, might not be the best answer. And I always remember when I was in school, I couldn't stand questions like that. So I was like, come on, I gave you the right answer. But there might be a best answer. So an optimization problem, you're looking for the best possible answer. If you type into your phone, right, let's say you're using Waze, which is a popular app when you want to find how to get somewhere. If you type in, okay, I want to, Let's say you want to drive, I live in Baltimore. Let's say you want to drive to New York, right? Uh, New York City. And you type it in, right? And you put it in ways. And it gives you all these different routes, right? There's many different ways of driving to New York City from Baltimore. But which way is the best route? Which way is the shortest route? Which way will take me the least amount of time, right? There's a route that probably goes, if you want to get to New York, I'm sure there's a route that goes down to Florida then goes out to Texas and California and up to Seattle and all the way across to Minneapolis and then back down to Florida and then back out to LA and then back up to Maine and then down to New York City, right? That's a route, but is that the best possible route, the shortest possible route? I know for me, like in some cases, I just want to find a solution, but in other cases, I want the best solution. Right. So when you're writing code, right, you might write code that works, but is it the best and shortest way? That's something to think about. All right. So we're actually going to experience that problem when we write the code today in this project. Efficiency is an estimation of the amount of computational resources used to use by an algorithm. So how efficient are you? Right? Are you able to do things efficiently in your code? Efficiency is typically expressed as a function of the size of the input. An algorithm, if you're writing a, a solution, a step-by-step -step solution, an algorithm's efficiency is determined through formal or mathematical reasoning. Right? What's the, how efficient is it? Well, you look at the formal and mathematical reasoning behind it. Okay. You can't just create an algorithm and say it's efficient. And you say, well, why? And someone asks you, why is it efficient? 
and you say, well, it's because I said so. Well, that's not true. Like there are some problems that you might ask me. And if my answer was just like, well, it's because I said to do it that way, right? Some of you guys might respect that, but some of you guys might be like, well, why? What's your answer? Why? So uh, giving a reason that makes sense. An algorithm's efficiency can be informally measured by determining the number of times a statement or group of statements executes. Right? Different correct algorithms for the same problem can have different efficiencies. True. Algorithms with a polynomial efficiency or slower constant linear square cube etc are said to run in a reasonable amount of time. Algorithms with exponential or factorial efficiencies are examples of algorithms that run in an unreasonable amount of time. So if I say like, I'm going to go ahead and highlight this exponential or factorial efficiencies. All right. And this is going to be a polynomial efficiency. Okay, um, some problems cannot be solved in a reasonable amount of time because there are no efficient so uh, there is no efficient algorithm for solving them. In these cases, approximate solutions are sought, and that's where um, in the next project we'll be talking a little bit more about simulations. Sometimes simulations are a way to help solve a problem. For example, if one of your problems was to see um, like uh, let's say like forest fires, right? Let's say there's four forest fires that are going on and you wanna see which, uh, you wanna do some tests and see uh, what the possible solution is to fighting these forest fires. A solution would not be to go out and start forest fires. That would not be a solution, right? That would make sense. So sometimes a simulation might make a little bit more sense um, where you're simulating things maybe through a computer instead of actually like, doing it so some problems cannot be solved in a reasonable amount of time right um, and there's not an efficient algorithm for solving them a heuristic and we talked about it a little earlier a heuristic approach is an approach to a problem that reduces a solution that is not guaranteed to be op is not guaranteed to be optimal but may be used when techniques that are guaranteed to always find an optimal solution are impractical so sometimes going through and using a heuristic approach makes sense. Okay, the last bit I'm gonna talk about before we go through the project are undecidable problems. Okay, there exist problems that computers cannot solve. I believe that's the same line of code. Yeah, the same, not line of code, the same sentence as before. Explain the existence of undecidable problems in computer science. A decidable problem is a decision is a decision problem for which an algorithm can be written to produce a correct output for all inputs. Okay, different from an undecidable problem. The difference between a decidable problem and an undecidable problem. An undecidable problem is one for which no algorithm can be constructed that is always capable of providing a correct yes or no answer. You're not always going to get the perfect solution to a problem, right? And sometimes the most efficient way okay, um, is not able to be constructed. So an undecidable problem may have some instances that have an algorithmic solution, but there's no algorithmic solution that could solve all instances of the problem, okay? We're always looking for ways to solve problems and look at data, and you know, you see data science just like exploding. There's a lot of new careers in data science and analyzing data, right? Data analysts, data scientists. but being able to use that data to come up with real solutions aren't always true. Like what if you were trying to solve, like predict the winner of every single NFL game, right? Based on statistics. Now, if you were able to do that, <laughs> you would make a lot of money, but a perfect solution is not always possible. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm just using that as an example, like predicting the future is not always possible. All right, so moving into the project here, it says the tic-tac-toe project. So we're going to create tic-tac-toe, and we're going to use it using TKinter. 
Now, your game must do the following things. We're going to use the grid method instead of the pack method. And I guess I'll start off here by going to a project. And this was just what I created before. And I knew I was going to create tic-tac-toe later on in this video. So I just call it tic-tac-toe, T-T-T. I'll go ahead and get rid of this. So imagine a tic-tac-toe board. All right, so I don't know. Let's say, well, you guys know what tic-tac-toe board looks like. All right, you got two vertical lines running parallel with one another. And then you have two horizontal lines running parallel with one another. And they make kind of like the hashtag symbol or the pound symbol or the hash symbol, whatever you want to call it. So imagine that we have nine squares, right? We have one square in the top left corner, right? We have one square in the middle, top, top middle, and then we have top right. We have middle left, middle center, middle right, and then we have um, bottom left, bottom center, and bottom right. All right, so let's go ahead and just like, just for a visual representation, this isn't actually the way our project's going to look, but just write something out, right? So let's say this is going to be space zero, and I'm going to start counting at zero because computers start counting at zero, and that will help in this project. All right, so I'll say zero, say one, and two, all right? And then I'll go ahead here and add my horizontal line, all right? And then I'll say, um, let's say this is box three, this is box four, and this is box five. And then we'll go ahead here and end it with at the very bottom. We'll call this box six, we'll call this box seven, and we'll call this box eight. Okay, so if you imagine like a tic-tac-toe board, Maybe I'll do this to make it look nice, right? Imagine you'll have a top um, to do this. I'll add a pound symbol or hashtag symbol at the end there just to make it like look like a real box, right? I'll do this here. You're really going to have nine boxes. Now, in this project, they're going to be buttons, right? We're going to make them into buttons. Now, that's just the way that I make it. Like I said, like I'm going to just make the easiest possible solution to this project in my opinion, but you might make something entirely different. and You might think a different way is easier. It's up to you. I think using buttons is the easiest way here. So imagine that I have a button here, button here, and we have the nine buttons. Excuse me. So thinking about tic-tac-toe, uh, let's say the X goes first, right? And the X chooses to go in the top left, right? They would choose there, and then O's would choose, and you'd go back and forth and take turns. That's why we went to that take turns algorithm, all right? So knowing this, I'm going to keep this up here. And this is not what our board is going to look like exactly. It's going to be a TK enter window that shows up, but this is important because I want you to notice what we're going to name these buttons and call these buttons. All right. So the first thing I want to do, since I'm using TK Enter, I'm going to import TK Enter. So I'll say from TK Enter, import everything. And everything is used. You write a asterisk. All right. And then I want to create my main window that pops up, and I'll call my main window root. Whenever you see root, just think main window. I'm just making my main window. And I'm going to create it from the TK class. And then I want to keep my main window open, right? So I'll say root dot main loop, and that just loops and keeps the window open. So if I just run this as is, and I just add some space in there because I'm going to throw some things in there in a second, right? I get this blank window, right? Not even close to me in tic tac toe yet. We'll get there. All right, but if you think about it, right, I want a button here, zero. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So I want to add some buttons. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add my first button. And I'm just going to call it button zero. I'm just going to call it button zero. Uh, it's probably not the best name for it, but that's where it's going to be located in the top 
left. Now, I'll say button zero and I'll create my button by using the button class and I'll type in root because it will eventually go in the main window. And then after that, um, I'm gonna go ahead, normally in the past few videos or the past few times we used TK enter, I've just said like dot pack and I've had you just use the pack method to pack it in there. We're not gonna use the pack method. We're gonna use something called the grid method. Now check this out, all right? In order to use the grid method, we're going to have to enter a row, and we're going to have to enter a column. And we haven't entered anything. Let's set it up. So when I do, now remember the computer starts counting at zero. Well, in the grid method, it starts counting as zero as well. So let's say this is column. Columns are up and down, and rows are left to right. Columns drop down. Rows are left and right. So instead of writing out column, I'll just say C. This is column zero. And this is column one. This is column two. So going down, column zero, column one, column two. And then rows, right, instead of writing out row, I'll just say R. So this will be row zero. This will be row one. And last, this will be row two. If I wanted to identify like this right here, this would be like the seven, this would be row two, column one. That's how you would access it, right? So if I wanna put button zero in a grid view, right? I want to go in row zero, column zero. So I'll say row zero, and then I'll say column zero. And if I go ahead and just run this, right, I'm gonna get this small button that just shows up here, right? And it doesn't do anything yet. I wanna make that button a little bit bigger. Let's make it a little bit, uh, let's change the height and the width of the button. And you can change the height and width of the button by going in here and I'll say height. And the height's gonna be two, okay? Because it's gonna be too high, at least that's what I'm gonna do for mine. And then I'll create a width of the button. And if I were to type in like 10, right, and I run it, you might pick the certain width that works for you. 10 to me looks a little too big, right? Maybe I'll do five. So I'm gonna go ahead here and change the width to five. See what that looks like. All right, that looks a lot better. Now we've only actually added one button, so we have to add eight more buttons. So we have to add a button here, here, and then two rows beneath. So what I can do is I can copy, paste. So that's one, I need to make nine, right? So two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then I'm just gonna change the names of them. So I'll say button one, button two, button three, Button four, button five, button six, button seven, and button eight. All right, so I create eight buttons, but I haven't actually put them on my screen yet. Just because I created the buttons here, if I run it, right, only one button still shows up. I have to actually use the grid method to put it in the right spot. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. Um, so I'll say button, one dot grid and well you know what i'm gonna be all lazy or even call it efficient just talk about solving problems efficiently right so two three four five six seven eight nine. efficiency at its best right there right now let's go in this is gonna be button one button two button three i wouldn't want you guys to type all that out right Sometimes when you copy and paste things though, it can get confusing because you might actually not hit the right thing. You just gotta have good attention to detail, all right? So, will this work? No, it won't because I gotta change my rows and columns. We said that button zero was in row zero, column zero. What about button one? It's in row zero, column one. So row zero, column one. What about button two, right? Button two is in 
row zero, column two. All right, and then, so I've done all of row zero, which means the next ones are all going to be, these are all going to be row one, okay? Next three, that way I can check it, three, four, five, three, four, five, and then this down here, this is going to be all row two. And we're going to do the same like we did for the first three here, how we did zero, one, two. I'm going to copy zero, one, two. And you can always double check and make sure that these buttons are going in the right places. But I can assure you that everything's gone in the right place here. The way I can check is I'll run it. And if it looks like this, then you're on the right track. Okay. So now, you know, I did it. I made tic-tac-toe. Nope, not yet. Okay, these are just buttons. If I click on the buttons, nothing happens. I just made my user interface, my board. All right, this looks nice. All right, so what else? What else can I do? So this is the point where like, I normally would turn it over to a class and say, what are some things we got to add to make this into tic-tac-toe? All right, let's go ahead and let's brainstorm. Why is this not tic-tac-toe? Well, first, you have to be able to take turns between, yes, take turns between X's, X and L. Okay, and you pick a square. And so I'll say, like, when you pick a, you click a button, I'm going to need for it to turn. So the button text, button text um, needs to be set to whoever turn is up. So whoever is up. So we have to change um, whether X is O's, X is O's, X is O's. And also what we're going to do is we're going to um, we're going to add color to it. So it's not just X's. And O's, but we're gonna make the X's we're gonna make the X's red and we'll make the O's yellow. So I'll say um, take turns between X and O, and then I'll say red and yellow. So moving forth between the two. So it'll be red a, a button with a red background for X and a button with a yellow background for O. Alright. So that's tic tac toe. Um, what else? So also in tic tac toe I can't actually click the same button once it's been clicked. So if I go X in this top corner right here, someone can't click over my button and make it O. Right, that's not how tic tac toe works, at least tic tac toe that I know. Right, so we're going to have to disable the button after it's clicked. So once that button is clicked, once this top left button is clicked, no one can click it again. So we're going to have to disable button after it is clicked. Um, and also, we have to determine who wins. Right, we have to determine um, what actually uh, determines what actually we have to determine what actually constitutes a win in tic-tac-toe so like there are actually if you count them there are eight ways to get tic-tac-toe you can get one two three four five six diagonal seven and diagonal eight so i need the computer to understand so I need to comprehend, I use lowercase, comprehend or when winner, when there is a winner, okay? And maybe I want it to display on a label. Another, um, another thing I want to put I want to make this clear too. This is a two player tic tac toe game. It's not versus the computer. So it's just player one, player two, player two, one, player two, player one, player two. Thus the take turns algorithm. All right, so we're not playing against the computer here. If you want to make it where you play against the computer, that's fine. 
right? You can do that, but I think it will, um, I think it's best to maybe start with a two player version of it. I think it's a little bit easier. And then you can always migrate if you want to make changes to your program and make a change to your game and make it where it's first the computer. And that's great. Okay, so, and then also I have to determine when there's a tie. So maybe instead of the word comprehend, maybe I'll say determine. Um, determine when there is a tie. And I'll display that on a label too. And I'm sure there's other things I'm going to end up doing, but these are the first five things I'm going to focus on. All right. These are my milestones and my trackers. And once I go through and I notice there's something wrong, we can always change these up. All right. So the first thing I want to do is let's take a look at take turns. How do I take turns? Well, I'm going to create a function. Right. I'm going to create a function and I'm going to call it. Um, X O I guess change change X and O. That's what I'll call it. So change between the X's and the O's. Take turns between the X's and the O's. I'll even make a comment here. Take turns between X's and O's. So it just changes between the two. Okay. So how am I going to do that? Well, first, what I want to do is I'm going to create a, a variable. So going in every single time when you play the game, you're always going to start off where X's go first. So I'm going to create a variable and I'm going to call it X or O. And I'm going to create a variable and I'm going to assign it X, right? So you know it's either an X or an O, whatever is in the sign of there. So I'll say something like I'll use the global variable X or O, meaning that everywhere throughout the entire program, this global variable can be seen, right? So I'll say global X or O, and it will always be able to be seen throughout this function two. So I'll say if x or o is equal to x, remember when we first talked about, remember we first talked about this take turns algorithm. If it is equal to x, a double equal symbol, then we want to assign it. If x is just went, then you actually want o's to go now. And you assign this variable to O. Else, if X's did not just go, then O's must have just went, which means now it's X's turn. So we're going to add or assign that X's are up. It's going to take turns. We're also going to create a function that allows me to take turns with the color that I mentioned between red and yellow, red, yellow, red, yellow. So I'm going to create a, hmm, yeah, that's what I'll do. I'll create a separate one. You can do it in the same, but I'm going to create a separate one um, just so I'm not confusing. I'll create a very, I'll create, not a variable, I'll create a function called change color. Okay, and this is going to switch switch between the red and yellow colors. So whenever you start off, I want it to be a red X. So I guess I'll start off with the color, right? I'll create a variable called color, and the color is going to be red. Okay. And just like the last, I can literally watch this. I can copy this algorithm that exists, and I can just paste it down here. And I just change the names of it. Rather than X or O, I want to change it. I want to change the color. Okay? So I'll say, if color, I'm just changing it right here, is equal to red, color will now be yellow. And else, 
I'm going to assign color. If it wasn't already red, now it's going to be red. So the take turns algorithm can literally just be copy and paste it. We can reuse it, which is nice. Okay, so we have these two functions. We haven't called those functions yet. Um, what I want to do is, before I call them, I want to take a look at something, right? We created all these buttons. And if I went and actually created a command where with when each button is clicked, it called a function. So you guys should have used this already, right? Um, in the menu project, you create a command and then you can just like type a function name and it will do that whenever that button is clicked. Rather than make a button zero function and a button one function, a button two function, and three function, that is a way to solve the problem. But what is the most efficient way? What is the what is the uh, the best way of solving this problem? And we want to create an algorithm that solves the problem efficiently. That's why we've chosen this project, Tic Tac Toe project, in order to do that this week. Okay, we've chosen Tic Tac Toe project so we're able to use a efficient solution on this project. There's a bunch of longer ways to do it. And some of you guys might be okay with doing the longer way, but the point of this project is, project is to think, what is the most efficient way? And the most efficient way is not to make nine functions. It's to make one function and find a way to make it work. But we're going to have to manipulate a few things. The first thing I want to do is I want to create a list of all my widgets, okay, all my buttons that I have in this. And the reason I'm going to make a list of all my buttons is to show you that we're going to be able to access certain items in that list, certain elements of the list, because of its index, rather than just identifying each button as is. Lists are very powerful. Okay, so check this out. I'm going to create a list called buttons. Okay, and in this list, and I'll make it a little bit bigger here. Right. In this list, I'm going to go ahead and add button zero, button one, button two, button three, button four, all my buttons, five, six, seven, eight, and last one. Now notice that I did not put, um, I'll move this over here a little bit so we can see it. Notice that I did not, I did not, did not, did not put um, quotation marks around my buttons. These are just saying, hey, look, I make a list of all the buttons. So that way I'm able to loop through and access them via their index, right? Remember, if I'm looking at a list, this is index zero, index one, index two, index three, index four. The reason why I named this button zero was to help me remember that that is index number zero if I want to access it if I create a list of my buttons. Okay, so in order, like if button zero is clicked, right? Let's say you start the game and button zero is clicked. Let's say that's the very first button. And remember button zero is up here. If I click button zero, I click button zero. It should put an X in it and it should make the background red. And then we're going to switch to yellow. So the next person, the player two, if they select uh, a different square, a different button, that that should show up then as a yellow circle. So how do we do that? Like I said, we could go ahead and write commands for all of these buttons but and write separate commands and certain uh sorry write separate functions that deal with all these commands but that might not be the most efficient way so what i'm going to do here is i'm going to create a function called select or just imagine that this is going to be um whenever a button is clicked, do this. Okay, so whenever, maybe I'll say like button 
ETN selected, right? So whenever a button is selected, do all this. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look here. What do I want to actually do? All right, so whenever a button is selected, I want to I want for it to show up as either red or yellow, X's and O's, right? Um, I want it to then change turns the other person to go. So what I can do is, check this out, I'm about to show you something, and it might not make sense right away, right? But have faith and pr I promise you that by the end of it, it will make more sense. All right, so in a command, instead of just typing button selected, have it do this button, right? And do this function. What I can do is I can use something called lambda. And what that allows me to do is, like, let's say I want to pass a value from this function right here. I want to pass a value, an argument, right? Let's say I wanted to do button selected, but I wanted to pass zero to it, right? And I want to go ahead here and in this function here, add in this parameter number, right? So I pass a zero into this. If I wanted to do that, it wouldn't work because when you create a button, it doesn't want you to add any parentheses after it. That's just the way it works. But how can I make a change and how can I allow it to accept this zero value to allow it to signify that I'm dealing with button zero? How can I do that? We can use something called lambda. And lambda allows you to stretch the rules a little bit. You type in lambda and you write a colon. Okay? And that allows me to pass a value into here. All right? So you still say command, but you throw in this, this word lambda. And you see how it shows up a different color here. Orange, I believe that is. All right, so what I can do is I can go ahead and pass a value in and tell it, hey, look. I'm dealing with value zero in here. So I'm going to go ahead here and let's go ahead and let's see what actually happens when I click my button. Well, I want the button that was selected, whatever button that is, I want that button to change. So the way I can do that is I can go into my buttons list that's down here. And index it. And now you index it. You, whoops. Those are curly brackets, curly braces. Hit my bracket and then put a number inside here. Now, this number is going to change every single time I click a new button. So sometimes it might be zero, it might be four, it might be five. So the number that I passed into it, zero, goes in here. And then I'll go ahead and type in num. So if zero gets passed in here, then it's gonna change this value right here. And what I wanna do is, I want to configure, okay? I wanna configure that button. Whatever button I sent into here, I wanna configure that button. Now, what I also have to do is, I'm gonna to have to use the global X or O variable, and I'm gonna to have to use the color, right? Because we're going to change the X or O and the color. So I'm going to set whatever the text is for that button. Right now it should be blank. I'm going to set the text to whatever variable is up, either X or O. Like I said, right now this might be confusing, but when I run it all through and I'll explain it again, hopefully it makes a little bit more sense. Okay, so I'm changing the text to either X or O. And then I want to change the background color. The way you change the background color in TK here is BG. I'm going to make the background color whatever color is up. Right? So this only we've only programmed one button here. Let's go ahead and let's run it and let's see what happens. Invalid syntax. Define change XO. Um, what doesn't it like? Oh, look at this. Look at this. I forgot to add parentheses on these. 
I wrote these functions and didn't include in parentheses. That's a dumb mistake. Very dumb mistake. But I just saw, I just figured it out. So if you guys were watching the video and were copying right along, you might have noticed and said, Mr. Danzo, why didn't you add parentheses there? Well, I just added them. Like I said, it's never going to end up the first time the way you want it to. Let's see what this problem is. Same button 9. Oh, look at that. I added button 9. Another problem. There is no button 9. So button 0, button 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And I added button 9. And I just fixed it. Some of you guys went through and probably added button 9 as well. And weren't paying attention. Some of you guys might have noticed it. You said, Mr. Dan's is going to get an error there. And here we go. So here's how we test it. The only button that really should work right now is this one. Let's test it. It worked. Click again. All right. We haven't actually changed it. So it hasn't actually gone between red and yellow. Red, yellow, X is X. So what we're going to do here is at least that first part worked. All right. On the right track. Now what we're going to have to do is we're going to use a nested function, a function inside of a function, the same way when we talked about the animals and reptiles and mammals and birds. Right? We're going to put a function inside of a function, and we're going to change XO. And then we're going to change the color. I'm just calling these functions that I created above. Right? So now if I run it, I click here. Now, fingers crossed, it should change. I don't really want it to change because we haven't programmed everything, but it should change to O and yellow. And it worked, right? So at some point, we're going to have to disable where you can't click the same button over and over and over again. But none of these other buttons have been programmed yet. Now, check this out, though. Since we've already figured out how to do it one time, and we've been able to make this scalable, and we can do it over and over and over again, we don't need to create more functions. All we have to do is copy this efficiency, right? Paste, 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 paste. We only have to change one thing about each of these. Button selected. When button zero is selected, pass it a zero. When button one is selected, pass the argument of a one. When button two is selected, pass the argument of a two. I feel like that's way too many. Yeah, check this out. Okay, way too many parentheses. Go ahead and close that. All right, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Rather than writing all these new functions, you could do it that way. That is a way to do it, but this way will solve you time. So. Using lambda and using arguments will save you time. It might not make sense right away, but here's where it comes from. If I run this program right now, check this out. If I run it and I click this button, whoops, I accidentally clicked it twice. If I click it, an X will show up. If I click another button, an O will show up. X, O, X, O, X, right? So it doesn't work all the way because I'm still able to, to click the button. Right, and it not change, and it changed to. I'm able to click a button, and it still changed. It should be disabled, but I haven't added that code in yet. Right, so how do I add that code in? What do I do? All right, so what we're gonna have to do is, whenever a button is clicked, we're gonna have to disable it. And the way we do that, and I'm gonna all I have to do is go right in here. I'm gonna say buttons. Whatever number button was just selected again, right? I'm going to configure the state to disable. Which actually, you know what? Rather than rewriting it, check this out. I can just do this. I'll just say state is equal disable. By doing that, that means once the button is clicked, you can't click it again. Let's go ahead and run it. All right, here's a moment of truth. I click it, let me try clicking it again. Doesn't change. Zero. Okay, good. Or O. X. O. And you can't re click one of the buttons you already clicked. 
so it's disabled, which is nice. All right. So how do we determine a winner? All right. I guess that's maybe the next one. Let's see what else I got. Right. Yeah. So here's what I've done so far. I've changed between taking turns. When buttons clicked, I'm able to set it up. Okay. And then also, I've been able to disable the button after it's clicked, so a user can't click it twice. All right. So how do I determine when there's a winner? My daughter's just learned how to play tic tac toe recently. I'm surprised it took them this long, but they they have a actual tic tac toe game. Um, it's just like I don't know, like a wooden board, I think. There's the wooden pieces that go on there, and they play it and they mess around. So when I made this game originally, they were excited. They're like, "Oh, like I can play it on the computer." But you know, this is um, a fun way to go through this game. You know, it's cool to think like the way think the way a game is made and then recreate it. So determine a winner. How can I determine a winner? So I said there's eight ways of getting tic tac toe. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. So the way that I'm going to do this, and this is how I'm going to do it. This doesn't have to be the way that you guys do it. Okay. I believe that this is the easiest way. I think it's the easiest way to create a hidden board that's in the background. And the way that I create my hidden board, I'm going to say hidden board. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create a list. And I'm going to put nine values in the list. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight, whoops, eight, and nine. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so I made this list and it has a bunch of zeros. Okay, and remember this is index zero, this is index one, index two, index three, index four, index five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so what are my ways of getting tic tac toe? All right, so remember there's eight ways there's zero, one, two, so zero, one, two. There is three, four, five, uh, six, seven, eight. And then there's zero, three, six. There's one, four, seven, two, five, eight. Zero, four, eight. And then the last one is two, four, six. Let me just double check and make sure I have them all. One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, these are all the different combinations. All right, so think about this way. If behind the scenes I'm updating this board every time and I'm changing like index zero, right? Um, let's say you click in the top left corner, I change this to a one and I evaluate every single time if there's a winner, right? If I evaluate every single time, if these, if zero, one, and two are filled with ones, right? I could create a function that does that. And if it's a winner, then say you win the game. So what I want to do is first, let's create a label, right? And so I create all these buttons up here. Maybe I'll just add, maybe I'll add it right below, right? I'll create a, a result, I'll call it result label. So it tells you whether you win or lose or tie, who wins or who ties. I'll say result label and I'll create a label and um, I'll put it in the root. And it's going to be a blank label to start off. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this label, say, whoops, I'll say result label uh, maybe i'll do this maybe i'll put it up here so that way say those are my widgets there okay a list of buttons okay so i'll say result label and i'll say dot grid and i want it to go in row three which is going to be right below it and I'll say column 
of zero. And then I'm going to use something called column span. And this will go across how many columns across it will go. Okay, and we talk about these in the TK Inner videos. So column span, I'll say three. Okay, I think that's right. Let's go ahead and test it out. Let's see. All right. So I have this blank label down there. All right. So I've got the board. And then if I would have won there, right? If I would have won, it should set up, it should show up and say, you win. All right. So how do I do that? So let's go in here. I want to create a function. And I'm going to call it it up here. And I'll call it um, check. I'll call it check winner. Check for winner. Make sure to add the parentheses in there like I didn't do with my first two functions I made. Okay, so I'm gonna check whether or not there's a winner. Um, and the way that I can check whether or not there is a winner, I can go in here and say if Well, I guess what I want to do is when the button is selected, I'll back up one second, back up. When the button is selected, what I want to do is I want to take whatever, um, hmm, let me think about this for a second. Um, I'm thinking if the correct number I guess I'll say X or O okay so what I'll do is instead of a zero right instead of zero like they're gonna have to um, edit this and it will change a value in the list which will make it Maybe I'll make these blank values, or I'll just make a random letter. How about that? I'll say, um, instead of zeros, I'll make these A's. I don't know. Um, Let's see what happens first. Honestly, let's see what happens. So the reason I'm debating right here, I want to end up taking a hidden board, right? And I want to take the index number, whatever was passed, right? I want to assign it to whatever is op X or L. Okay, so whenever the button is selected, let's say I'm playing the game and I select a zero, right? What it's going to do is it's going to find button zero and it's say, all right, what command do I want to do? It's going to do the button selected command. It's going to configure the button to be either X or O and detect the color and disable the button. But then what it's going to do is it's going to go to our hidden board and it's going to enter in a certain index. It's going to enter an X or an O, right? So maybe zeros. Um, don't make the most sense there, but we'll see. Um, so we'll assign that to either X or O. Let's just see if it runs as is right now. Run module. Make sure it's on the error. Okay, gotcha. I'll just comment this out. We'll run it once more. All right, I haven't gotten any errors. So we'll see. All right, so now we'll create this function called check winner. All right, and every single time before we change, we will check winner. We'll call it later, but what we really want to do is, what we really want to do is, we want to check and see if, okay, if hidden board, one, 
is equal to um, x row. And hidden board, I'll say this hidden board zero and hidden board one is equal to whatever x or o value is up. And I'll just copy and paste this. And hidden board two is equal to x row. And I'm going to put a I'm going to put parentheses around this. So if this condition is true, basically saying if one, two, zero, one, and two are all, let's say, x's are up. If that's x and that's x and that's x then you're gonna win, right? So that's one of the combinations we went through, ready? So we did zero, one, two. Now we need to do three, four, five. So I put all these inside parentheses, right? So that way we can evaluate this condition and that's done. The parentheses are important here. Or, now I could continue that really, really, really long line of code that keeps going on and on and on, or I can add this continuation character, right? Um, which that is not the continuation character. This is the continuation character, a backslash, right? So I can go ahead and copy all of this. Let me just make sure I hit enter here. And I'll say hidden board, we said zero, one, two. And then we did three, four, five. And I'll go ahead and add this. We're going to do this uh, six more times. So I'm going to copy this. Say three, <coughs> excuse me, four. Five, six, seven, eight. All right, different combinations. Let's look through them. And we add my colon there at the end. All right, so three, four, five, and then six, seven, eight was one winning combination. And we had zero, three, six. Let's see if I can maybe get this bigger so I can see it all. There you go, that way shows you everything. Zero, three, six. All right, so zero, three, six, one, four, seven, one, four, seven, um, two, five, eight was a winner, two, five, and right now, like I mentioned before, we're just adding all different winning combinations. 0, 4, 8. 0, 4, 8. And then 2, 4, 6. 2, 4, and 6. Make sure you add that colon on the end there and hit enter. Now, this looks a lot nicer than our really, really, really long line of code. Something can be messed up there. Okay, so we'll see if it ends up working. <laughs> so if there's a winner, so if one of these conditions are true, right? If this, or this, or this, or this, or this, if any of those are true, then we want to change the label down here, result label. So we'll say result label, configure and we'll configure the text of the label and we'll say whoever won right so we'll say x or o
as one. Maybe I'll add this uh, X's or O's, whichever one, has one. Has uh, one the game. And I could use an F string instead of doing this, right? Maybe maybe I'll do that um, instead here. I'll say uh, an F string, right? And a highway will just be easier. Get that out of here, right? And I'll just add probably braces in there like that. And I'll add these curly braces like that. X's or O's. So X's has won the game. All right. Whichever team is up, if that's true, then say they've won the game. So we need to check each time the button's selected. So uh, we'll update the board. And as soon as the board is updated, we'll say check winner. Recall that. So when the button's clicked, right, uh, we'll make the move, we'll update the hidden board, and then check and see if there's a winner. If there's no winner, then we just keep going. All right. So let's go ahead and run it, see if I get an error. All right. X, O, X, O. Here's a moment of truth. If I click this X, it should pop up here and say, there's a winner. X's have won the game. Now, let's go ahead and play again. See if O's can win. Whoops, I'm clicking all random things. I got excited, right? I got excited that it worked on the first time, all right? So X, O, X, O, uh, X, O's has won the game. Okay, nice. That works. But here's the problem. I still, I mean, these are disabled, right? But what if I click here? I have to disable all the other buttons, right? So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to disable everything. So if the if if there's a winner, I want to disable all the buttons. So say they've won the game, but I have to disable button one, button two, button three. So what I'll say is, I'll say for all the buttons, a for loop, for all the buttons in buttons, for all the buttons in buttons, um, I'm going to go ahead and say I dot um, configure, I'm going to configure each button to the state is going to be disabled, all right? So I'm going to loop through all the buttons. Uh, I'll loop through even if it's if it's already disabled, then it's going to stay disabled. But if it hasn't been disabled yet, then we'll disable them. So we'll loop through all the buttons in buttons, and we'll disable all of them. Power of a for loop and the power of a list. It's awesome. So run. Let's test it out. Fingers crossed. Let me try clicking here. Doesn't work. We are really close to finishing this game. This is awesome, right? So here's a bug that shows up. Though. Check this out. The more you play it, like let's say you're a, let's say you want to get a job as a video game tester, right? You just play the game, play the game, and you figure out until something gets goes wrong. Here's an example of something going wrong, right? Um, there. And the game's over, but nothing happens. Right? So I need to think of a way to say if, and I need to loop through all the values in my hidden board, if none of the values are zero, okay, if none of the values are zero, then I need to go ahead here and say there's a tie, right? I need someone to pop up and say, you tie, right? So um, 
the way I'm going to do that. Let's think about it. Do I want to create a function there? Or I want to check each time. And I'll say, yeah, I'll just create a function there. I'll say check pi. Okay. And we'll say for all the values in hidden board, if that value, so if I is, let me think about this for a second, for all the values in hidden board, I want to make it so it looks through each of the values and sees if um, if it's zero, right? If none of them are zero, maybe there's a different way of doing it. If Oh, I know a good one. I can say if zero is not in hidden board. So if the number zero is not in the hidden board list, so there's no more zeros. If there's no zeros in hidden board, then I was trying to think of a really hard, complicated way. This is a lot easier. If there's no zeros, which means every single spot has been filled up, then we want to configure the label to say tie, right? So the way I would do that is I would say, um, what's the label called? Result label. Result label dot configure. Um, We'll configure the text uh, and we'll just say tie all right so check winner and then I'll call it and I'll say check tie let's see if it works I'm not sure if it's going to but let's see uh, X O X O. I'm trying not to win. X tie. It shows up as tie. So a few more things I want to add in here. Uh, let's change the the title up there, right? So I'll change the title. Um, I can do that by. Um, I'll do this, I'll say root dot title, title of the game is tick tack So maybe I'll change the geometry of it, change the dimensions of the window too. I'll say geometry, um, I don't even know where it's at right now, I'm probably gonna have to play around with it. Uh, let's see what 200 by 200 looks like. Sure. Okay, well, I guess I can just leave it the way it was without changing geometry. I was just seeing if you could add tic-tac-toe to that. Uh, I won't mess with the geometry. I'm just playing. I just know that the title is there if I ever want to change it. All right, so if I run it, here's my tic-tac-toe game. I guess I want to see the title of it, tic-tac-toe. I can spread it out there. Um, let's play. All right, X, O. X O X. Oh, look at that. And X's have won the game. X's has won the game, or X's have won the game? I should probably say have, right? X's have won the game. All right, so this is what I believe is a easier 
way of making tic-tac-toe. Um, I use the hidden board. Maybe you guys decide to do something different, but there's a board behind the scene that's being updated at the same exact time as the one that you see. That's what that means. So I did all these things. Let me look at the project file. Let's see if there's anything else I got to add. Okay. Did we use the grid method? We did. Check. Show an updated game board with every move. Check. Change turns after each selection. Check. Disable previously selected squares so that the user cannot choose a square that's already been selected. Did that. Disabled. End the game when a user has won the game. How can you determine a user won the game? Did that. End the game in a tie when all squares have been selected. Use color. We did it all. Good to go. All right, be creative. If you wanna, if you if you do this, like let's say you're done right now, and you want to keep going, save your file and do not make changes to it. Save it, and then create a different file or a copy of it and edit that copy. Because if you edit this file and you make a change to it, and your project ends up getting all messed up, then you're going to be sitting back thinking, wow, I really shouldn't have tried to do that, right? Notice that even when I went through it, I made some mistakes. I took a heuristic approach in doing this, right? Where sometimes trial and error works. I didn't go into the project knowing exactly how I was going to accomplish it, right? But I tried some things out, it didn't work. Tried some other things out, they didn't work. And then I finally found a way to do it, right? So that's a heuristic approach. And that will be on the exam, plain and simple. So moving forward, um, take screenshots of your code in the code editor. You're encouraged to add on beyond, right? Answer the following questions. One paragraph, three to five sentence minimum. And there's only one question. <laughs> Walk through with me and explain how your tic-tac-toe game works step by step. All right. So. I'll explain step by step how mine works. What's going on? Where's my game? All right. So I'll walk through step by step. Brief rundown. Let's try and make it beneath two minutes. Ready? So this right here is just a visual representation of what my board would look like as I was planning it. These are a list of all the winners, right? And I'll update that, right? These are the list of all the winners. And I'll just go ahead and make comments as I go along, right? And I'll just say, like, visual representation of the board, right? Winners. Um, this is my, like, list of things to do. Um, I imported TK Enter, right? So. I only had one thing. These are my imports. Um, these are my variables and lists that I use. Right beneath, these are my functions. Right, this first function, this change between the X and the O's. This one changed the color. This one checked each time to see if there was a winner. Check to see if there is a winner. And this one, check to see if there is a tie. And this is whenever button selected, do this. Um, this right here was I created create a main window to add things to. Okay, this is my game title. Okay, these are all I created. Create all my buttons. Well, I guess a label too, so I'll say widgets. All right? And this is my list of list of all my buttons. Um, this is how I organize buttons into rows and columns. And then finally at the end, this is um, how I keep main window open and running. All right, so that's my program, right? First bit of code, more code. 
and code. Don't just copy and paste all of my code. Like change up the variable names, um, make some changes to it, be creative. If you want to try and make it versus the computer, you can. Uh, where it might actually not be that terrible because you can just determine what moves the computer does. Right? Um, but yeah, be creative with it. It doesn't have to be exactly like mine. It might even be, might even be beneficial to you just knowing what you just learned right now. Just sit down and try and do it yourself. And then look back at this and see if it worked. All right. That's all I got. That's the project. If you have any questions, let me know.